Um, so let's start off by some introductions. Um, why don't we just uh, go down and introduce yourselves and uh, you know how you're associated with the with our topic this hour. Go ahead. We'll start with Rolf. All right. Thanks. Hi, right, my name is Rolf Brink. I'm founder and CEO of Asperitas, uh, a company uh, focused on immersion cooling. Part of the business drivers behind Asperitas is a vision in which uh, uh, data centers are playing a fundamental role in a global energy transition, uh, specifically focused on the fact that uh, data centers are actually very effective um, uh, power conversion plants where electrical energy is converted into heat, which uh, as long as you do it very effectively, it should be possible to make that useful. So before we move on to Don, so I've I've known Rolf for three years now. It's about three years, I think. We met yeah, together. We met in the Netherlands yeah. at at your uh, your facility over there, and uh, you got involved with OCP, and um, you've been a very strong supporter and proponent, and very vocal about um, sustainability and the role that it should play, and 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 what we could do with sustainability. And last night at dinner, you said, I'm, I'm really proud of what OCP has become when it comes to sustainability. So uh, I am too. And I think a lot of it has to do with the, you know, your persistence in, in pushing us in that direction. So I just want to say thank you for that. So. <laughs> okay. I, I appreciate it yeah. very much. Uh, I'm going to be paying more attention to what I say <laughs> well, <laughs> from sure. now going forward. <laughs> How about you, Don? You want to give a quick introduction? And so um, Don Mitchell, I've, my first introduction to data centers was back in 2000. I joined this company called APC. And uh, probably the best perspective I can give on sustainability is maybe a historian to a certain extent. You go back to uh, 2000, and uh, we were introducing uh, UPS systems that were 97% efficient. And I'd go to engineering firms, and they would say, if you think we care about efficiency, you don't understand data centers. And then you'd flash forward about 10 years after that, and I got LEED certification. And I looked at the concept of how bike trails and uh, low flush toilets were going to make uh, data centers more sustainable. Um, and we've always had this concept uh, for the years of sustainability, motherhood, and apple pie being good things to pursue, but not really defining where or why they are in context of data centers. Data centers have always assumed that they have a mission critical function that precedes and uh, exceeds um, the requirement for um, sustainability. Well, flash forward to last year, um, I found I wasn't traveling as much as I used to, so I volunteered for this program called OCP. And they uh, got me engaged in the concept of uh, adding liquid cooling to data centers. Um, and so, and by the way, my jobs had transitioned to, uh, from Schneider to Eaton, uh, where I was selling switchgear, and then to uh, a company called uh, Victaulic, where we're looking at liquid distribution. So I've seen sustainability from a lot of different angles. And going back to those, uh, with the advanced cooling facilities, we started looking at reference designs. And one thing a year ago, even just a year ago, the concept of sustainability was a good thing to do and we should be doing more of it. But in the past year, it's transitioned to not just a rec um, recommendation, but a mandate. And so last year, I was sitting there thinking that sometime we'd be looking at reference designs for heat reuse. This year, we're actually uh, not just doing that, but we're talking about it. So as we go through the conversations today, we're going to cover a couple things in terms of what is sustainability. It's a huge umbrella. I have some perspectives on that, but I only look at part of the umbrella. We may talk about heat reuse, and I have some perspectives on that. So thanks for the intro. Well, and, and thank you for your involvement in OCP. So I'm going to say something. That I'm going to add some color to this. Um, so Monday, we had a, our board meeting the OCP board members. And, um, and because of the work that you two have done in pushing forward the challenges of cooling um, and efficiency, um, we actually made a proposal that we actually create a new work stream, a new a top level project to focus on, on cooling specifically. And so it was, I think it was one of the first times our board of directors made a unanimous decision in favor of it. So it's hard to get hard to get those guys to agree, but that was it was unanimous. So again, you know, thanks to both of you for 
all of your efforts. I'm sure you guys announced that earlier today too, but um, anyway, again, thank you. So let's move on to Andreas and you were with Rital and, and Rital's been on this journey with us from really from day one. So, so tell I'm, us about you and Rital and your passion for her. Yeah, so I'm Andreas Maya. I'm a um, product development engineer at Rital in, um, in the department for especially IT cooling equipment. And uh, I'm here in Rital since 10 years. And you may know Rital is a global provider for infrastructure components and things like that for, for the IT industry, for data centers. And um, so therefore our, let's say, global footprint regarding sustainability makes an impact. If we change things, it changes a little bit the world. Let's call it like that. And so I'm, I'm involved in, in the de development of, of products from really from, from a white paper. And therefore, um, sustainability has to start before we start in, in the development. So it has to start in the way of, of thinking development in the way that, yeah, not only margin, cheap um, production as it always was. Mm -hmm. um, so it starts before and I think OCP can really contribute into that because OCP can make standards for sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, I think you're, you're telling us that, uh, you know, to address sustainability, we have to think about it very early in the design cycle. I'm going to come back to that and talk about that in a minute, but I want to um, just talk about the technology and, um, you know, what, what's the new technology that, that you guys see that are going to drive uh, sustainability and, and, and as well as continue to drive efficiency. And, you know, we have, we have a lot of things kind of on the horizon with immersion and liquid cooling and heat reuse and, you know, the, the notion that we have to address scope three emissions and that involves embracing circularity. So, you know, what are, what are some of those technologies that, how do we, how do we bring that together? And I'm, I'm actually going to start with Rolf because he's. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of uh, things that are currently happening, and, and, and we're actually, OCP is in the midst of it, right? Um, uh, OCP is one of the first industry platforms, um, if, if not the only one still today, that is seriously and completely embracing liquid cooling and liquid as a basic infrastructure, which, uh, which helps with the, with the overall efficiency of carrying heat and transporting heat and capturing heat at very high values, at, at, at high grades, right? So that, that's one element, and that's where uh, liquid cooling technologies are attached to the sustainability mm -hmm. side. That's uh, a cold plate running CPU, running chips at high temperatures. It's immersion, being uh, being able to operate systems at elevated temperatures. Also, rear dock coolers that facilitate even the basic input into that water circuit that can even be upgraded throughout the facility and be taken on by the facility. And and that's uh, the the fact that OCP OCP embraces these technologies and is facilitating that industry wide adoption of it means that OCP is currently playing that pivotal yeah. role in, in the market. Uh, but there's more to sustainability. We're also talking about life extension, right? Uh, the IT renew propositions where IT is given extended life. We're talking about circularity in, uh, in system designs. And these are all factors that uh, uh, when you start designing a system, you already have to plan for what happens at some point in the future when a product reaches end of life, how are you going to deal with components? How are you going to be reutilizing stuff? Uh, and these are all factors that help out with that sustainability approach. And this is where OCP is going to back, back into position. that aspect. We got to design it from the beginning to be sustainable. Oh, yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so scope three, you, can you define what scope three is or uh, expand oh, on that a little? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a shot at it. So it's the the carbon 
uh, and greenhouse gas emissions that are created during the manufacturing process and the transportation process, the mining of the raw materials, then the conversion of the raw materials to metal and plastics and, you know, coatings and, and uh, devices, right? And then... Uh, Fantastic discussion. The reason I bring that up is I would say that most people that I'm finding, I still have a hard time remembering the scope one, scope two, scope three. <laughs> I understand conceptually what it is, but what you just described is something that's very hard to wrap with a metric in many cases. It's easy to wrap with a concept, but it's hard to wrap with a metric. But to what Rolf said, the concept of uh, making something recyclable, IT Renew spoke on the concept of taking servers, and if you have something like a server and you put a server uh, that you can uh, reuse in, a, uh, say, a server from Meta and have that something that can be reused at another project somewhere else. That is a perfect example of reducing scope three. You've basically recycled the circular economy and things like that. Um, as we look at uh, different aspects of reference design and data center design on the cooling, if you can make a data center robust enough so you don't have to redo it or re and you minimize the ability to, um, or the effort and the investment and the uh, greenhouse gas associated with converting from one technology to another, that's uh, another uh, way of looking at things. Um, the, uh, it, it's a very hard, I know that my company, I work with Victolic, we have a wonderful brochure that talks about how we try to reduce some um, uh, footprint uh, in terms of, but uh, recycled materials, 80 to 90 percent um, recycled materials. One of the key challenges is we can put that in there, it's a very honest statement, but auditing it, making it an auditable statement is hugely expensive. So it's not that we're not honest, it's just that there's a big difference between honesty and auditability, and scope three pushes that environment. So you may end up uh, doubling the cost of something if you make it auditable, so how do you keep honesty without audibility? That's a key challenge we have, but it's happening. And one of the key things I see is the fact that it's becoming a forefront conversation means that everybody has to have that answer. Mm -hmm. So we have to talk about recycled content. We have to talk about um, what we're doing to minimize the construction. And one aspect of liquid cooled may end up being that you don't need a massive building. Um, so then your scope three emissions associated with that conceptually could be lower. How to calculate that, how to compare a, a liquid-cooled only design with a, uh, a traditional design that has a very high energy efficiency. And that's the other problem we have with the metrics. I was on the green grid for years, and the green grid at one time was very productive. When I say very productive, and I don't mean to denigrate the green grid, they came out with terms like PUE back when PUEs were 2.5. And they did a great service to the industry by driving PUEs down to 1.3 or something like that. Now they've become a game, and we can't really use PUE as a sustainability metric. Um, we can, it's, it's a macro metric. If you're at three, you know you're bad, and if you're at uh, 1.3, you know you're better. Um, but when you get below that, a lot of times you find the auditability becomes a challenge. Um, arguably, and I strongly support this, if you look at the map behind using liquid cooling, it makes it more efficiency, so that goes you back to the, is that the scope one or two that's your efficiency side? That's... Yeah. Two. Two. <laughs> Just wanted to give a pop quiz here. Okay. So, um, we'll, we'll jump, and, and so we're looking at more efficiency. Um, so I, I kind of rambled around here, but one of the key challenges we have when we start talking about scope three is clear metrics yeah. um, versus this seems right, this seems good. And one of the key challenges in our world, in our community, is if the data center industry doesn't come up with its own metrics, we'll get a lot of help from the local communities. We don't need their help as much as we, well, we, we, that can be helpful if we can help direct it. It'd be, it'd be nice if we can lead rather than be regulated. Exactly. I yeah, was in yeah. Navy and uh, when the Admiral came on board and he said, do you have a plan? I always had a plan. So our, we, do have a, we do have a sustainability uh, work stream and they are absolutely tackling absolutely. metrics and trying to get in front of that. I think I agree. So, um, you know, we talk about, um, you know, liquid cooling. Um, you know, I live in Arizona now, water's, you know, water, well, it doesn't matter where you live, water's a crisis, right? Um, you know, what is, what's your thoughts on water conservation? Because we talk about energy conservation, you know, what, what technologies do we have to have to promote water conservation? <laughs> Go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to jump in there, right? So, yeah, and, and this, this is 
uh, like I mentioned before, this is, this is where that elevated temperature operation really starts for yeah. that to become relevant, right? Because hey, what is consuming the water? Well, an actual water circuit doesn't consume water. You're not losing water by liquid cooling. You're losing water by evaporative cooling, right? So if you want to... Uh, uh, adiabatic style cooling, that's where you're losing a lot of uh, very, valuable, uh, very valuable resources which we need to live, right? And, and the water consumption is a main uh, contributor to, uh, to sustainability, uh, to the downsides of sustainability in the data center industry. So working towards elevated temperatures where you do not need that evaporation anymore is key, and again, this is where liquid cooling becomes critical. So, uh, you know, how, how high do we have to elevate the temperatures for that to work? Well, obviously, that depends on the region, okay. of course, right? So, uh, but if you're, uh, um, uh, you have, it, it may not even be relevant to be able to, uh, to abandon evaporative cooling for all of the year, but you might want to have a look at, hey, what is the dominant temperature throughout the year? What are the, what are the temperatures, the, the ambient temperatures yeah. most parts of the year? Um, let's say that it's 35 degrees C, you want to make sure that your liquid cooling environment can operate safely and sustainably at, around that ballpark. Okay. Right? And even if it's slightly below, it may not be a significant impact as long as you got you covered for about 90, 95% of the year. Right? These are the things that you need to start looking at and where the OEMs are going to play a critical role. Because they need to make sure that that IT equipment is going to be capable of doing that in combination with the liquid cooling technologies. Yeah. So, you know, that gets back into, you know, how to design for sustainability. So when we come back to Andres, we, we kind of touched on the need to think about these and design it in from the beginning. Um, talk, talk about that and what do we need to do and what are we doing? Could I just add something to the last Absolutely. Topic? So, yeah. so um, I, I think that the topic with water conservation is more related to the scope three emissions because when you manufacture the products, especially hardware, there's a tremendous amount of water that has, that has been used. And I think there we have to look at water conservation. And uh, I, as far as I hear from the industry, I'm, I mean, I'm not in the semiconductor industry. They already do that. And I think they must do that. And in the end, it, it's related to all the manufacturing processes where you have to, to use water for cooling for um, any processing. And uh, I think there the water usage needs to go down. That's what I wanted to add. Yeah, no, and I think that's a good point that, um, you know, water does create scope three emissions. Um, and, and I'm just learning this, but, you know, when we bring water from the northern part of California to the southern part, we pump it, you know, it's pump, pumped up and then dropped down through canals, same with Arizona everywhere on the world, right, uh, it creates emission. Also, just the, the water going up and down creates greenhouse gases as well. It's trapped behind dams. So an interesting transition discussion on this is there was a, uh, an award received by Cloud and Heat recently for coming up with a way to take data center waste heat for desalination plants, yeah. okay? So that kind of creativity, the concept of looking at um, something waste heat which prior to a year or two ago, most people didn't pay attention to where the heat went at a data center. The whole equation was get it out of the building, we're fine with that, in the easiest way, in the best way. And now trying to actually realize that data centers don't consume energy, they, consu take, they transition electrical en energy into heat energy, and if you can actually use that in a productive manner, and even more, uh, and this probably is transition to another topic, and we may want to spend some time, this is one of my passionate topics, but I've got to pull back here, but I was using the transition point of water usage effectiveness. If you actually, uh, more and more data centers, there was a data center company, uh, several that are being told they can't build because of water. If the data center could actually produce water, and actually some companies like Meta is building uh, uh, water uh, purification facilities, to offset their water usage effectiveness, to try to become more uh, perceived as more sustainable. If you can do both, if you can drop your water usage and have your waste heat contribute to water, um, that's even better. Yeah. So what Don is talking about is um, our future technology symposium that was held on Monday. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the group of technologists, the down select papers to be presented, 
Um, there was a couple dozen papers. One of those was from Cloud and Heat on this very topic. Uh, and then the, in four different categories, they chose the top paper in four categories. And then um, the committee uh, met um, on, actually we finalized our selection on Tuesday morning. I, was, I, I had a chance to go read those papers at 7 o'clock and look at the posters again. <laughs> and, uh, and so that particular paper was chosen as the best uh, paper presented at the symposium this year. And they were awarded the $10,000 um, uh, check. And uh, we hope to continue to engage with them in the future and um, help them develop that technology. What was really interesting around that technology is that they, they rely on, on high heat, high density, high heat. Right. Um, and so we have traditionally focused on you know, water temperatures, I'll, I'll say like sub 60 C. They're focused on water temperatures above 60 C. And the reason is they want to they want to you know boil the water desalinate right, and so the other thing that's really interesting is that as they get closer to the equator, their efficiency increases, and if you look at where people in the globe live, we all the majority of the people live closest to the equator right around the equa equatorial bands, so I mean it's fantastic technology. And so it's fantastic in so many different ways. 15 years ago, that paper probably wouldn't even made a podium. No one would have wanted to talk about it, okay? Yeah. 15 years ago, we did not have immersion cooling uh, or cooling technologies that were producing 70 degree, and I think uh, 60 or 70 degrees um, Fahrenheit, uh, centigrade liquid. And 15 years ago, we didn't care. We really didn't. The data center industry was all about reliability and, and was still trying to do tier four wherever they could. And, and now we're seeing that we have to wake up and do something different. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, to that point as well, I mean, it's a good point that you're making that about 15 years ago that these things were really not being discussed, right? Nobody was interested. And this is also uh, uh, what we've seen in the past couple of years uh, in that sense is a great development, not just in the OCP landscape or for all the stuff that we're doing, but what you're actually seeing is that end users and customers are taking this stuff more seriously, where 10 years ago, Sustainability was a topic to get you into the boardroom to do a pitch. <laughs> but when it came to decision making, that all that people looked at was just a dollar sign on the bottom, right? That, that's, the the phrase, only, that's the only sign of Greenwashing is a, a term yeah. that people, they always wanted to be green. I mean, yeah, they exactly. have a cigarette with green smoke coming out of it just to be a little green. Yeah, you know. just for the sake of it. <laughs> hey, but in the past couple of years, what, what, you, what you can really see is that, hey, companies are actually investing. That they're, they're spending that money up front. Um, they know that on paper, okay, sustainability is actually cost effective. Right. Yeah. But because it's new, it's unknown, people get uncertain about it, but hey, they take, they take that, they, t they take the chances, and they know that it's necessary, and they are supporting it, and they are taking those steps. These companies, I mean, we're talking about big and small, even the smallest companies, but also the large uh, hyperscale companies or enterprise users. Sustainability is now key, and a key investment item. And what all these companies are now discovering and that's even the best part of all of this. I say, hey, you know what? That sustainability that we wanted to, that we thought, hey, that's going to be expensive. We need to invest in it. We need to spend more money so that we become greener. You know what? That stuff is actually cheaper I'm and gonna more come, reliable. I'm going to come back to that, but I want to I talk about uh, design because we skipped over that earlier. And as you, you hit on, you know, design for sustainability and things that we need to, things that we're doing today to be in preparation for circular economy for some of these technologies. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, um, I don't see it so positive as you do, Ralph. So when I look at, 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 at our market, and that's good. our customers, it, it, it needs a lot of um, discussions what sustainability means, that it is cost-effective, and what it has yeah, an effect for your, for your company. Um, but in the end, it, it has to, to start. And yeah, everyone should promote that, even to the small custom customers 
that it makes sense, but it has to start before the design starts. So, like the people who who make a specification or a let's say a, a business plan for a new product have to have to really implement sustainability as a key feature, not as a secondary, third feature, nice to have, but so what if, you, if it's not recyclable? So I'll give you a, a, an easy example. So Rital delivers IT racks. It's an easy product, just metal, but you think it's, it's just metal. So when you, for instance, when you think about packaging, it's big stuff, and when you roll all those racks into a hyperscale data center, and afterwards you're standing in front of the hall and seeing the hill of waste, there's something wrong. Because most of it, for instance, holy bags, holy bags, yeah? That's something we should avoid. It's a hill of holy bags just to protect <laughs> the paint. Uh, yeah. It's just to protect the paint. And I mean, those, those racks go into the data center. It's, it's, it's not a Ferrari. It, yeah. Is it an ugly rack, an unfunctional rack, you know, or one with a paint scratch? Yeah, that's yeah. an interesting point. Should you touch up the paint on your racks? <laughs> can we, can we overcome that? I mean, are, are we prepared to say, I don't need a painted rack? In fact, rust is OK? Ooh. Well, I mean, <laughs> rust. That's, that, that, that's, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not. It's not like the, the, that. That it rusts away in in, in some years. No, it, it will last way longer than your IT and probably than your right. data center design. So. Well, I guess a question, and you. It's, you phrase... it's just an example. Yeah, you know. So things like that. It's a small screw, but it has a large impact. Yeah, that's right. So keeping this in the context of water, do you think the tide's changing? That what is changing? No, tide is changing. Is the emotional tide, are we actually, one of the things I feel is a year ago, I started this project on how to add liquids to the data center. And we went with the premise that people needed to add liquids because of capacity, uh, of the, the ability to cool chips, because air wasn't hacking it. So people had not, they've been using liquid cooled for years, but they haven't been doing that much. When we started the project, the focus was enabling performance I will tell you, in the past year, I'm now feeling that what we may find is moving to liquid ends up being, uh, sustainability ends up being the driver that pushes liquid into more data centers, maybe as much, if not more, in some cases, once we prove the sustainability equation, it could turn out that that ends up being the driver that pulls liquid cooling into data center as much as um, the ability to cool a high density chip. Any thoughts on that? I mean, do you see that, or is, is that tide changing? Or you think it's always going to be, I'm always going to use air, um, unless someone proves to me that uh, I can't? Um, I think the tide has not changed yet. But I, I would say the, let's say the impact of data center industry, especially from the big ones, it's, it's really under a view of the economy under a big view of the people. So it has an impact, but I think they have to change because otherwise they, they will be, uh, they will have great hashtags on, on, on the social media. Well, it's <laughs> funny you mention that because just this week, and yeah, I don't want to so. embarrass anybody, but there was a data center company that um, is suing to keep their water usage classified. Okay. Just an interesting concept. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd like to respond to that I, I, because I, I, I like the point that you're making, actually, um, uh, and uh, for a very simple reason. Because I, I'm, I'm in immersion cooling, right? Uh, I deal exclusively in liquid cooling, so every person that I engage with is, by definition, interested in liquid cooling. So therefore, I've got a very biased view of what this industry is doing, right? And that's. It's great, and that's why I like what you're saying, because you're, actually, you're also reminding me, and I assume also Don, because I think Don, Don is in exactly the same mode that I am. He's, he's doing pipe work. He's doing liquid cooling. Well, he's, he's, 
I'm basically a crack yeah. pipe dealer. Okay. Right. I deal with <laughs> computer American conditioning. Uh, let's I not talk about crack now. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, the point is, it's, it's good to remember that, hey, even though we're overwhelmed with all the work that we're doing and we're, we're eagerly uh, engaging with the entire industry to facilitate this global transition, and hey, our work is just getting started. Uh, and, and that's the thing that makes me think, like, hey, yeah. Uh, we think that also with OCP, we're starting to create a movement, but hey, this is actually only just the tip of the fill. This is just the first of the drops. Imagine the workload that we're going right. to deal with uh, as soon as the rest of the industry starts moving along. So one thing to clarify, where I work, I work with the flow of liquids. And so whether or not it's an immersion cooled or door heat exchange or even traditional air cooled data centers, there's still going to be some sort of delivery system that goes to a cooling solution. There's going to be an evaporative pipe solution. So we, I see all of those things. And I've seen the equation where people say that your, um, you know, your water usage at your facility is a fraction of the water usage at the uh, power plant. And so a more efficient data center actually lowers your, your total water usage, even if it, your site water usage might go up. So water usage is also being a challenge because to a certain extent, it's also a regional problem. There are some areas where water is a very precious resource, and there's another area where it's a very renewable resource. It comes back every year. I live in Seattle. Okay, just kind of putting in context on that. We've got plenty of water in my backyard. <laughs> I want to I jump to a, another topic. Um, and, and I'll give you some background. So we recently conducted, we have the Omdia market research, and they conduct, conduct research for us every year to give us an idea on, on market trends and the size of the impact that this community is having. We threw some sustainability questions at them this year, and, and, um, and much to my disappointment, what we were learning from this survey is that, you know, the per, the, there's barriers to adoption of um, sustainable practices. One is this notion that it costs more. And second is the notion is that it, it is, affects your reliability. And uh, I don't think that's the case. Um, but it means that we have a tremendous amount of work to do to educate people. Um, does it affect reliability? Does it affect cost? To oh, be yeah, absolutely. Although in the opposite direction. Okay. Right? Say more. Look, if you got the, the, the basic principles behind liquid cooling are really tremendously simply. It's, it's, it's a much more natural approach to, to energy transfer, right? You're talking about high, uh, uh, high heat capacity fluids that are in direct contact with the components that are high powered. Hey, that's going to reduce thermal stresses. There is going to be a more effective management of that, or protection of that IT equipment. And this is what it's all about. The problem is that the perception is that it's risky because it's new, right? It's liquid. What happens if you've got a leak, uh, but you get a short out? So, but you know what? All these things are mitigated. I mean, liquid cooling has been around for many years, and, and there's continuous innovation and continuous development. So all these challenges are already largely overcome. and. Um, when it comes to the cost side of things, um, uh, and this is uh, yesterday, I had again a great conversation with somebody uh, about this. Like, hey, yeah, a, a rack is so many dollars, and an immersion tank or a cold pledge solution is so many dollars per mm -hmm. rack. Well, you know what? Comparing CAPEX figures, it's got nothing to do with TCO or, or overall cost savings or efficiency, because that's not a figure that you can compare. Yeah, of course, liquid cooling solution is, by definition, more expensive if you compare a bare rack to a liquid cooling solution. There's no way around it. But it's, the cost effects are spread out throughout the facility. You're talking about you're saving money on the entire facility by changing your rack definition. You're just moving cost, and you're reducing your operating cost. And that has been proven in so many different business cases with uh, so many independent parties. Liquid cooling is cost effective. It's more I, sustainable. I would think that the, uh, you know, the reliability um, uh, and certainly the cost of, of uh, piping, you talked, Don talked about all the piping and pumps that, you know, that, that's fairly reliable equipment. And, 
and you know has a useful life of what 15 20 years or so well so the useful life can be 30 years on a, on a pipe system or more okay? okay and if you properly design and, and you properly employ a key thing here is be smart okay one of the challenges we have with sustainability is is making a broad brush cost first time of anything is the most expensive time you're going to do it so that's what OCP is trying to do, is to share the first times, to, to minimize the cost by making it so you're not doing it the first time when you do it the first time. It's not being done the first time. Yeah. You, um, drive out costs by repetition, drive out costs by best practices, and um, also by incentives. You look at the solar industry. Uh, years ago, it took incentives to get people to use solar, and the solar industry responded. And they came up with lower cost solar power, and they came up with lower cost distribution. And now solar is used every, it doesn't need incentives anymore. Same thing with liquid cooling. I think that there are areas where we need to incentivize to uh, be smart because of its efficiency, but then pull it back, and eventually it'll be self-sustaining in a uh, much better way than it has been. You're absolutely right. So I think some, some people must have incentives to buy the first time, use it, and make it their own experience, and then they have the feeling, oh, it was the right decision, and especially liquid cooling or direct on-chip cooling, whatever it is, so something else from air um, will have an effect on that. And um, I mean, I'm in IT cooling, so not only you two, so, yeah. and um, it, it, it will have an effect on, on all sides, because when you, you think about the all facilities that are air-cooled with direct air cooling, you need large ducting systems. All your data center is very complex. It has to be optimized by CFD. That's cost. That's cost. You don't need that anymore with liquid cooling, because it's been pre-designed. It's, it's a yeah convenient product just Plug in, use, and that's it. I'm going to uh, switch topics again here and, and uh, talk about uh, heat, heat reuse. So, you know, uh, Rolf's in the Netherlands, uh, you know, in district heating, the notion of, you know, turning your, your, your heat over to the district, to the city, is r relatively easy to understand, and uh, the resources are there, and, you know, it's been plumbed for that. Um, you know, you live in other places of the world. I don't know any city in the U.S. that has district heating. Um, you know, what, what, what do we do? What, what are our opportunities to reuse heat if, if it's not in the, you know, local vicinity? What's a, you know, what's the, what's the, is there any other benefits from this? Well, yeah. I, I believe it is, but you have to be creative, right? I mean, let's be, let's be honest. If there's no heat grid around, um, you're going to have to look at other ways of utilizing the heat. heat. Just remember, heat is energy, right? Cooling it, blowing it away in the atmosphere is just exergy destruction. You know what exergy is? Right? Uh, exergy is the usability of the energy, mm, right? Okay. So, when I... <laughs> yeah. That's so, cooling is actually destruction. It's it just destroy you, you, you're destroying the usability of it. Now what what is gonna be uh, interesting, especially when you're talking about these high temperature operations, is that when you're planning a data center facility and there's no heat grid, there might be other industries that may be able to benefit from the uh, from the users of heat. And we just heard a great example of desalination, right? I mean well, yeah. we cover that. That's one angle. But hey there's a gazillion other so speaking of that, every week the, uh, we are now featuring the heat reuse story of the week um, on this uh, advanced cooling facilities uh, discussion. So a couple of weeks ago we had cloud and heat. Um, last week we had CSC, and CSC, great story here. CSC, uh, and again, I know this is a, a, again, a company in Sweden, but what they did is they put in, uh, uh, they took the waste heat and they are reducing the amount of district heating that's required for, um, from coal burning facilities. So in essence, there's an argument to be made that they are being carbon negative in their process. They're using renewable energy, so they have zero footprint from that. And then they are actually retiring carbon generating um, production of heat. 
we have some other people. I know that Samur is going to be talking about a process they're doing over in um, Barcelona. Barcelona is well below the Arctic Circle. And so we're looking at, um, as you start working with higher temperatures, the waste heat that comes off of, of immersion cooling can be used for a lot more applications. We already talked about one that's closer to the equator. So that's why we're first starting with the, the heat reuse story of the week. We're next going to categorize um, what, uh, how can we break those down into um, uh, urban to um, agriculture. We also have Green Mountain next week speaking on how they've been using a waste heat for uh, trout and for lobsters. I got an open invitation to go to Norway for a trout and lobster uh, breakfast or lunch. Can I go? Sony. <laughs> I, I thought Green Mountain made grills too. Yeah. Well, they also, they have a very scientific approach to um, putting in, and they spoke here as well. So they have a very scientific approach. So what we need to do is first capture those stories, share those stories, yeah. and have people start looking for exactly. those stories in their own backyard. And this is also exactly what ties into uh, when I founded Asperitas, this is, this is exactly what I was see, envisioning for the future. A data centers yeah. playing a fundamental role in a global energy transition where data centers need to start connecting with other industries because that synergy doesn't, it doesn't have to stop at the perimeter of the facility. Right? You yeah, I think we're on the beyond. front end. You need, you need to get a connection with yeah. a completely different industry. Hey, um, we're kind of reaching the end of our 50 minutes. Is there any questions that you have for our panelists? Hi, this is Leonie from Cloud and Heat Technologies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shout out. you were referring to earlier. Um, I was the one presenting on Monday. Thanks again for the Thank great re recognition from yesterday. Um, I just wanted to add a creative idea of what we do with WasteSeed additionally. Um, so we came up with the idea to look at the vertical of architect, so agri-technology, um, agriculture. Um, as you know, I'm living in Dubai. I'm the director for Cloud and Heat uh, in the Gulf region. And since COVID, the whole region looks on how to produce um, necessities on their own because they import a lot, right, especially um, food. So uh, as you know, in terms of growing food, it's quite tough to do that in the desert. So we thought about we could use the waste heat uh, via an adsorption chiller, adsorption with a D, and produce cool. So we cool the greenhouses emission-free via um, the excess heat of a data center so the crops can grow. Great example of energy as an asset. Thank yeah. you. Hi, my name is Catherine from Microsoft. Um, I was interested, um, one of you was mentioning that you had some beautiful data on uh, how liquid cooling really improves TCO. What is your favorite publication? And can you share that? Uh, there's, uh, I'm happy to get back to you on that, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Any, anybody else have a question? Hi, I'm Famida from IT Renew. Um, take the mask off. <laughs> so um, in terms of example of heat recovery, um, there are actually examples. And uh, it's, it's striking. They, they may not be as prevalent in the journals, but a lot of the university college campuses have actually used heat recovery, very familiar with the Stanford uh, heat recovery system, having been designed, uh, having designed that in, in my prior career. And one of the things that we came across that was a real barrier to communicating the effectiveness of heat recovery um, is this energy water nexus. And it took forever to actually, for everyone to understand how waste heat is actually a resource, how it is actually a circular economy, best example of the circular economy design, how it saves money, <laughs> uh, how it avoids uh, carbon emissions directly towards uh, scope two or scope three through water. Um, so I think these examples exist, and one of the things that we could do um, is draw inspiration from other verticals as well and not just ICT. So I, I guess with that comment, my question to you all is that what are your barriers that you're facing in communicating the effectiveness of um, liquid cooling or just being able to use uh, what otherwise would be considered a waste resource to actually as an asset that goes directly into the carbon equation. Um, um, this could one, take one, more than a minute or two. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to be very short with just a single word response. Uh, that's fear. 
a fear. I'd also say there's a certain amount of um, legislation in some cases needs to change. Uh, one example is Facebook, uh, when, correction, Meta. Uh, well, back to the time it happened, it was with Facebook. But, um, so, <laughs> so, but they, uh, um, uh, they f became an energy provider and they were taxed on providing energy. Okay, so if you're going to take waste heat and try to do something better for the community, somehow people have to take off the tax of you uh, selling your waste heat, some, provide an incentive yeah. to do the right thing, not a, another punishment. So, and that varies around the world. The McCumber was standard process. But to your point, we are, there are plenty of examples. And the first thing we're doing is casting a net. We're uh, collecting all these examples. We're going to categorize those um, by the, the data center industry side first. But to your point, I've uh, put in data centers that did uh, heat, uh, heated sidewalks and, and heated pools at universities before. So thanks for I, that. I want to answer that um, as well, <laughs> even though I'm the moderate. So I think one of the problems we have, and I, again, I worked for Intel for 32 years or so, is we get used to kind of doing the same things. And so, you know, we at Intel, we had this kind of copy exact mentality. And, you know, if you build one building, you, you copy it. And I think in the data center industry, um, we're doing the same thing. You know, uh, hyperscalers are, are building, you know, they, they're scaling very fast. And the best way to do it is just to take a good design and replicate it. I also live in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, I watch the commissioning of a data center about a mile away from my house on the other side of an 1,100-acre field. Now, the commissioning took about a year to build, and during the course of the year, they turned that uh, six to eight times uh, vegetables. Now, if you live there all the time and you get to watch that field, you'll notice that during certain parts of the year, they, well, I call them hoop houses, they put the, the hoop houses out to retain the heat and keep the vegetables growing. Um, and had we, had we had the foresight to say, I, I'm, I know where I'm going, I'm in this vicinity, I'm in this field, what's around me? You know, could I do a better job rather than just copy exact? It's a beautiful data center. It's exactly the other 40 that they have around the globe. Um, but they could have looked around and said, gosh, I'm in the middle of a vegetable field that's 1,100 acres, right? We turn eight crops. By the way, less than a quarter mile away, there's a chemical processing plant that is using, I am sure they're using a lot of heat over there, right? And so I think we have to think about this and, and, and really <laughs> not just accept the norms that we have around us today. And that, that's my key point, is don't accept the norms that we have. The notion of just copy exact maybe it was good 20 years ago, but you know, we need to do a better job. And, and let's just be cognizant of those opportunities that are around us. Albeit small, they're still, still moving ahead. To the extent that a data center is basically a box, we need to think outside the box. Yeah, exactly. Be creative. <laughs> I think that's a nice note to... Uh, are we well, done for right. time? Are we done? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're over we're done. Break time. We're, we're at well break done. Time. We got done on time? Yeah. All right. Uh, 10.50? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, one last thing. Um, we, I mentioned with Omdia, we did this survey. We threw in some sustainability questions. I know the sustainability work stream is actually putting together a, a similar survey and really trying to understand from the community perspective, what are the things that are important to your companies? What should we be doing? And so as these surveys come out, they're going to go out to um, the community. Please take the time and effort to respond to that and get it back. We desperately need the data. We need to understand what you are passionate about and what you want to work on. And you know, we'll launch projects. The, the sustainability team really wants to know where to focus you know, their efforts. Where, where's the passion? What can we do? And again, it's you know, we, we are OCP. You are OCP. And so uh, please respond to the surveys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.